Great. As uh, mentioned, we are joined uh, by uh, Siobhan, Siobhan O'Neill, the project manager of the UN University's Children and Extreme Violence Project and editor of the report, Cradle by Conflict, Child Involvement with Armed Groups in Contemporary Conflict. And she is joined by Bukhari Sangare and Mara Refkin, two of the lead researchers. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I think it's quite fitting that we're launching our latest volume today on the International Day Against the Use of Child Soldiers. Um, our volume and the research project that it represents seeks to understand how and why children become involved with, are used by, and exit armed groups in contemporary conflict. This includes those groups that are deemed terrorist or violent extremist, and we are very much exploring uh, some of the widely held assumptions that those groups are fundamentally different and require unique policy and programmatic responses. Two of our researchers are here today. I'm very happy to introduce Mara Revkin and Bukhari Sanger uh, from the Syria and Iraq case study and Mali case study, respectively. I'm sure you'll have some questions for them on their particular fieldwork, uh, but I will just highlight a few overarching findings, if you don't mind, from the report. First, I'll just say the heart of this research is the in-depth fieldwork that Mara and Bukhari did um, directly with stakeholders involved in this, including children who had been affected by war and some of them associated with the armed groups examined in the report. This included focus groups with children and youth, uh, interviews with key stakeholders, and survey work. Just to give you an example, Mara had really extensive access to 45 children who have been uh, accused or uh, convicted of association with Islamic State who are currently being held in Kurdistan to try to understand their experiences. So I'll just highlight quickly five of the overarching findings from this report. One of them is the distorting effect of the violent extremist lens that is often applied, usually from outside, uh, to contemporary conflict. And in many ways, this single dimension viewpoint clouds what's actually happening on the ground. These multifaceted, complex, and offer inter intertwined uh, conflict dynamics that are driving the conflict there. So in Bukhari's case study in Mali, for example, that narrative is often used, but when you ask local populations why they're involved uh, in f conflict, they often cite intercommunal conflict over resources and cattle, often exacerbated by climate change, uh, extreme poverty, and state failure, retreat, and corruption. For them, these are much more pressing, and the term violent extremism or radicalization doesn't really resonate with their experience. A related finding is that ideology, again, given quite an outside uh, import by others, doesn't necessarily drive child association with these groups as it is often assumed. Um, ideology is entwined with many different factors and is quite complex, things like community or identity, so it's hard to really uh, unpack what's going on there. And in many cases, and, and some of Mara's research really highlights this, uh, in ideology becomes important after the fact as a post facto justification for behavior or association or maybe in the indoctrination phase, but was not necessarily a primary factor in explaining why a child became involved in the first place. Child association with these armed groups is a multifaceted phenomenon. So children don't get involved for one reason. They get involved for a number of structural, social, and individual needs, risks, and resilient factors. This brings me to a really important conclusion, which is the fallacy of neutrality. And so in many cases, I think there's an assumption from the outside that kids have the option of remaining neutral in some of these conflicts. But in conflict zones, when armed groups uh, control uh, territory and they exert physical or economic coercion over the population, it's virtually impossible for children and their families to stay unaffiliated. When the state assumes that every young man or boy is associated, there is no value in remaining unaffiliated. In Mali, uh, for example, when entire communities stand up and either create their own self-defense force or align with an outside group, it would be almost impossible to imagine uh, a young boy or girl turning to their community and saying, I'll just sit this one out. Um, lastly, we found in Nigeria 
as people were exiting, uh, many of them who had been abducted into Boko Haram, as they were exiting, we found that often they immediately went out and rejoined a self-defense group to signal to their community that they were no longer a threat. So in many cases, there was no option for them to stay on the sidelines. And I'll just highlight one more. Um, the pro-social appeal of these groups. I think especially when we think about some of the groups that dominate the headlines today, we can only imagine very negative reasons for why somebody might become associated because we only see their violence. But research suggests that children are largely motivated by pro-social reasons. So a defense or love of their community, for example. And armed groups, again, even from the outside, it's hard to imagine why they might be appealing to a child. But in many cases, they are. They provide ready-made identity. They provide community. They provide a sense of significance, a feeling of being part of something bigger than themselves, and some semblance of order amidst conflict. And for children in conflict zones, that could be quite appealing. So I'll stop there. Uh, we are starting to take these findings and transition them into programmatic guidance for practitioners. And I'm happy to talk about that or let you ask our researchers some specific questions about their case studies. Thank you. We'll take some questions. Yes, please. I would like to ask about your, uh, your insight on a developing situation in the Americas. As you may know, Colombia recently signed a peace agreement with uh, the FARC guerrillas, and for many years, the FARC, uh, you know, they have been pointed out as uh, taking minors for the conflict, and after the peace agreement was signed, there are different reports saying that they have not handed back all the kids they took for conflict. And just recently, we saw reports uh, coming from the Colombian-Venezuelan border saying saying that the ELN actually is taking minors into conflict currently. So I would like to know if there's like any kind of you know, additional insight that you could provide us on how concerning is the situation that is developing right now in the Americas. We didn't study Colombia directly, um, but taking examples from other conflicts, I think you can say a couple things. So, uh, you know, one is the issue of, of armed groups being forthright about how many kids actually are in their ranks, and they're always trying to balance sort of the public opinion and reaction to that. So there's that, that component as well. We do see in certain conflicts where children are seen as retaining their value, um, often girls. And so if they have been, uh, if they've served as wives or domestic servants within an armed group, they are seen as valuable to commanders even after the conflict ends. And so sometimes girls are retained, and so that's an issue. Um, we do see in cases, in the Kurdish case actually, where you have young girls who were associated with armed groups and they actually don't want to leave even if their group has signed a deed of commitment or has uh, promised to release underage uh, minors. And so there's that tension as well. So um, this is a problem across Cross cases, uh, especially as conflicts ends, you know, releasing children. So it's certainly not unique to Colombia, um, but this is a struggle. I'm afraid I can't answer some of the specifics on that case. Matthew? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner, Inner City Press. Um, this could be, uh, it may be construed as a Nigeria question or, or, or a more general one. I'd wanted to, you'd mentioned in, in your opening statement how. If, if governments or, or if, if it's assumed that youths are involved in some way, you might as well be involved. So I wanted to ask about a situation I've been following in, in uh, the Anglophone areas of Cameroon, where it seems like the government is very much thinking that any youths in these areas are part of a, a desire for independence or autonomy and targeting them. And whether, one, I mean, just as a general matter, if you could comment on, and two, if, if as well as anything else you want to say about the, the Boko Haram er, you know, areas of, of Nigeria, but what if you ran into this issue at all, and if you have any view on the recent repatriation or refoulement of Cameroonians by Nigeria back to Cameroon. Thanks. I'm afraid we probably can't speak to the Cameroon situation, but I do think we've seen this across case studies, and Mara and Bukhari may want to jump in here. Um, certainly in Aleppo, this was an issue, so I don't know if you want to address that. And I know for some of the communities in northern Mali as well, uh, being accused of being uh, quote unquote jihadist, actually lended itself to driving people towards the very groups they were being accused of. So I don't know if you want to jump in. Yeah, um, sorry. 
Uh, I can speak to this um, on Syria and Iraq. So one of the problematic um, things that we've uh, observed about state responses um, to the Islamic State in these areas is that children are assumed um, to be associated with a group um, simply by virtue of their physical proximity to the conflict. Um, and, uh, and often um, these policies do not take into account um, the ways in which um, armed groups like the Islamic State exercise very coercive control over children. Um, so you know, uh, under the Islamic State's legal code, if you are required to dress like a jihadist, um, uh, you can't um, not comply with that without being severely punished. And um, therefore, you know, when children are uh, fleeing conflict areas and um, detained by security forces in areas near IDP camps, of course they're going to be dressed in ways that resemble um, Islamic State fighters, regardless of whether or not they're actually affiliated. So um, one of the things that we're doing in our report is trying to push back on, on the assumption that physical proximity um, to these groups um, is, is legitimate evidence of association. Monsieur, est-ce que vous pouvez répondre la question en français, s'il vous plaît Je vais essayer. Ok, merci, merci. Les jeunes au Cameroun, les arias anglophones, le gouvernement pense qu'ils sont, ils sont des séparatistes. Ok. C'est la question. Ok. Alors, et vous demandez pour le cas du Mali. Alors, parce que au Mali, je crois que le conflit malien, il est très complexe. Vous avez plusieurs acteurs qui sont impliqués dans le conflit. D'abord, il a commencé par une rébellion indépendantiste. Et comme ça a été très bien expliqué par Sioban, au départ, c'est la communauté qui déclenche le conflit. Et tous les acteurs sont impliqués, qu'on soit hommes, femmes ou enfants. Et généralement, dans notre étude, nous avons vraiment essayé de comprendre d'abord qu'est-ce qu'est l'enfant dans la société malienne. Parce que les enfants, généralement, ils sont vus comme aussi des personnes qui peuvent soutenir la communauté au cas où la communauté est en difficulté. Et vous savez très bien, le taux de naissance est très élevé au Mali. Donc, les enfants, généralement, on les utilise comme des outils. Et donc, ils, ils soutiennent beaucoup la communauté. Donc, aussi, on a des cas où des enfants ont été impliqués dans les groupes djihadistes et finalement, ils ont été aussi arrêtés par les forces armées maliennes. Ils se sont retrouvés dans les prisons à Bamako. Et là, je crois qu'on a essayé, l'État malien et même la communauté internationale, ils ont essayé de mettre en place un système pour que si les enfants sont arrêtés, qu'ils puissent vraiment les soutenir et qu'ils puissent sortir des prisons. Donc aussi, on a d'autres cas où les enfants sont liés à des groupes criminels, terroristes. Donc pour ces cas, vraiment, ils sont traités par le gouvernement comme étant vraiment des, des, des terroristes. Et donc souvent, ils n'ont pas de traitement spécial pour le gouvernement malien. Voilà. Chapter on, on Nigeria, but I, but anyway, the answer was was much appreciated. Merci. Thank you very much, then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.